This is day five of the April 8970 retreat in spring water. Some people report that in sitting quietly, there's a great deal of boredom. Another way in which it is described is feeling an acute lack of stimulation, <coughs> of stimulation. that we normally have. And the discomfort of that. One person said, I see the floor in front of me or the grass. But, so what? <laughs> 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 so maybe we can take some time to look at what it is we label as boredom. And whether just labeling it as that, as one feels a certain state of being, whether just labeling it prevents the looking into it, investigating, wondering what this is. If one abstains from just telling oneself that one is bored, also seeing what goes with that, telling oneself one is bored and all the associated ideas of what, what boredom means. The idea of what it means, not what it actually is, throughout, manifesting throughout this body right now, and mind, thought and idea. The, the comment that one feels a lack of stimulation is a cue, isn't it? We are under almost constant stimulation in our daily life. There are few homes or rooms or cars left where the radio doesn't play almost all the time or TV. In our grandchildren's bedroom, the radio is on all the time. The idea being that this helps you to go to sleep. And of course, if the radio was not on one night, that would, there would be a lack. Something missing in the whole condition of going to sleep. Music accompanies our, our shopping in a store, which changes as the seasons change. A lot of young people do their homework with the TV or the radio on. I've never found out talked about that, what, what that provides or what the, what the helpfulness of it is or maybe just a habit of having that sound there. We 
we talk almost all day long to each other too. And of course we talk silently to ourselves, which continues during retreat. But there is the human voice almost everywhere, unless one happens to have a, a solitary job. Talking, laughter, shouting. Of course the whole thing of traffic, many people spending at least two hours a day in cars in the midst of traffic and the sound of the, the motor, other motors honking, tires screeching. We read a lot. A free moment is a moment to put something in front of the face, whether one is waiting at a doctor's office or eating breakfast. Something to, to, to have the eyes roam over, some, to take something in beside through the mouth. It's not, I'm not saying this critically, just observing. Maybe the only time one has to read during breakfast or lunch or whatever. And of course, while we're eating, it's the, the time to have conversations with each other if we, if we eat together. So there's not only constant stimulation, but double stimulation, two, two three tracks running, maybe four than that more than that, of input to the senses, to the nervous system, the, the whole pores and pores of the body are being poured over with stimulation all day long, work situation, entertainment. And it's, it is the most natural reaction of the body to respond with what one could call withdrawal to this from this stimulation when it doesn't happen. The body sort of craving it or missing it as something that is, that is accustomed to receiving and isn't receiving. So as that is experienced in whatever manifestations, physically, mentally, can one feel it as it manifests? Not worry about it. Not think it's wrong or try to distract oneself from it through fantasy to provide some stimulation really wonder what withdrawal feels like. We hear a lot about people going through withdrawal who've had addictions and then we usually think of drugs or alcohol, cigarettes, but we're all addicted to this constant stimulation from the outside and from our own thoughts. The feelings that thoughts bring to the body. And when thoughts may quiet down a craving or withdrawal from the good feelings. So can, can one be with this new condition? Wonder about it. Feel it. Not as something alien, wrong or bad. But as what is it? With an interest to find out about oneself from moment to moment, not about good things about oneself or bad things, but what is happening right now, this instant. And maybe in asking such a question, the mind, the, the thought says, I'm bored, it's boring. Well, what? What is this boredom? Is it the 
grabbing, grasping for something, or the inability to grasp for something? Is, does the mind feel dull? One person told me, I feel such low energy, so sleepy. There's nothing going on here. <laughs> what is sleepiness? As it happens during a round of sitting, if it happens uh, while one is up, then one may go to bed and sleep. I may be tired, been up or not slept during the night, or worked hard for months, and now there seems to be sort of a backlog of need for sleep, then to sleep. But as one sits around, one has decided to be in here, or wherever one may be sitting, and sleepiness sort of overwhelms the system, or, the, or creeps up. What is it? When we never ask or have an opportunity to ask these questions, normally. We just go with it, or fight it, think about it, call it by a name, and then react to, to the idea of it. A little bit of feeling. But here's the, the opportunity to, to really find out what sleepiness is. Not philosophically, or how does it manifest? The, the, the thought of a more comfortable position in this horizontal, it may, be, it may feel like a magnet pulling one into the bedroom. To, to lie down, visualizing one's pillow, the sleeping bag, <laughs> zipping it up and forgetting all about everything. <laughs> amazing thing is if one does it during the walking and does the pillow fluffed up, the zipping bag, sleeping bag zipped up, one may feel wide awake and not sleep at all. So to, to observe the whole thing, that's what we've been talking about. Not stick with a word or with a judgment or with a, what I should be doing here out what is going on here. <clears throat> A lot of ideas connected with sleepiness that I haven't had enough sleep or I shouldn't be so sleepy. Or maybe one discovers some kind of an escape in this feeling sleepy. It's something one does not want to get in touch with. Something somewhere threatening or annoying or irritating and not wanting to look at it. Which may also un unravel as one sits with boredom wondering what it is if one doesn't call it boredom. Very often there's a fear hiding underneath this idea of boredom. Or the idea I am incapable of doing anything. Others are, but I'm not. And the, the dulling of this idea, which is not new, one has had it for years and years and years. I can't do what others can do. And again, here yeah, I see it, it's the same here. And then the, the caught upness in that, the no exitness of the, of the thought, I can't do something. As one hears oneself talk in those terms, if one really listens. Because one wants to find out what this boredom is. Can one put aside any ideas that present themselves in our thinking? And wonder whether this is true? Maybe a false assumption one has had all one's life. There may be a false assumption that there is something to do at this moment something I should be doing. And there the eyes fall upon the grass or the floor. And isn't there immediately the idea of oh, this is the same old grass again? 
on the same old floor. And with that idea, seeing the idea grass, the image grass, but not what's out there, what's actually there, without any feeling of rejection or idea that it is this or that, or not interesting enough, not stimulating enough, to, to start freshly, to look at what one will not call grass, or floor, or knots in the planks, or beige. One will not use words, because one wants to see directly. Does one? may not even occur that there is something that can be seen other than our ideas about ourselves and the world that surrounds us. We're so used to living in this world of thought about ourselves and our surroundings and the other people. And can one question that radically? Whether this is all there is not have an answer for it, not look for inspirational thoughts in one's memory of what this universe really is, either illusion or shining brightness. But look. There isn't grass out there. What is it? This isn't a wooden floor, what is it? And this organism here, this physical body sitting here, what is that? The, the throbbing of the heart, if one doesn't use that concept, that word, can one listen? movement of the body rhythmically with breathing. It's not just where one thought, breath comes in and goes out, if one listens attentively, freshly. The breath may be felt to be everywhere, not as an idea, but actually. in getting up for a round of walking. Already, the motion of getting up is the mind, is the thought someplace else. Or can one wonder what it really feels like to get up? Or not being able to get up because a leg is asleep. To feel that, to touch it, to be in touch with it. Not as the one who is attentive. We've talked about that many times, how the image can become so forceful. I have to be attentive. I'm the attentive one. And the attachment, again, to the image of the attentive one, rather than just simply, plainly, in touch with what is going on as one foot after another touches the floor. Not the floor. We have to use words to talk with each other, but in, in walking, it isn't foot or floor, it is something else. It's not words, it's not past experience. Can the mind be so there, so still, not ahead, not, in, not lagging behind in memory, but out of stillness, watching, listening, feeling, touching. In this kind of way of being, with there is wonderment, there is not boredom, there is stillness of wonderment. Why is why is it so difficult to be 
with a simple moment of walking, sitting, eating. In, in all bareness, simplicity, without anything made out of it, not make anything out of oneself and do it, but just the holding of the bowl, the spoon, the taste, the fragrance, the juiciness of it, an orange bit on between the teeth and the juice pouring into the mouth. And as one looks up, the, the dance of the birds up and down, back and forth. The music, the music of birds. Spoons scraping off, sounding on the, on the bowl. Not to find something interesting to occupy oneself with, but just to be where we are. People say this, I want to be in the here and now, I want to find peace. But the here and now is not a concept. It's the absence of wanting to be someplace else or being in imagination someplace else or arguing with oneself or with another, monologuing, dialoguing quietly and mechanically, automatically eating or walking, sitting. Why is it so tremendously difficult? And then, as this one person said, when there actually was a moment, when there was just the apple and no word there, something that one, one cannot describe, then immediately the thought, so what? And what happens with that thought, so what? No more apple. No more immediacy, but the standoffishness of reflection. This isn't very much. Is that all? Is that what I came here for? And on and on. And immediately these thought trains accompanied by physical orchestration. draining of energy or uh, feeling depressed, sagging, or, or if, if the thought came, not so what, but wow, now I've got it. This is it. I've discovered it. <laughs> <laughs> this, these thoughts give an instant injection. body is full of chemicals. It's not just chemicals in, the, in, in medicines. I read this someplace, a, a staggering figure. At the time I tried to remember it correctly so I wouldn't sound like exaggerating, but now I've forgotten it. But it was something like 30,000 chemicals dispensed in one minute throughout the body. Not chemicals one is taken, but that the body is chemicals. which we feel as boost or drag, stimulation or withdrawal, headache or whatever. So, can one see the whole thing? Not become verbal or be verbal, remain verbal and dismiss the state of boredom and and wait for the bell. But at the, at 
the instant of becoming aware of all of that, start to wonder what is really going on. If one steps out of the, the filing room or the audio room into what's really there. Not expecting anything, that's thought again. But looking, feeling, listening. One person asked, you talk so much about self-image, the self, the me. I'm wondering if there is sort of a cosmology going on here of self and me and self-image. People becoming conditioned by your words and talk, beginning to talk in the same way, think in the same way. I'm wondering if all of this is accurate. It is true, there are certain words that are used over and over again, although it feels like a moment of grace when a new word occurs. Because there's a tremendous getting used to words, a tremendous danger of not looking anymore, but beginning to think facilely within the framework of words. And so quickly believing that understanding the words clearly means clear understanding of what the words are pointing to, namely how one functions directly from moment to moment. It's inevitable that in a place in which people come together and work and somebody gives talks, that there comes a, uh, there emerges a vocabulary, a certain vocabulary. And if one does not understand what the word really is pointing at, then please let us clarify. It must be very difficult to hear a word and not know what it is referring to. And I do work very hard to, to not just remain on the verbal level, but point to what in ourselves this word is referring to. And I can't do it for anyone else. I can do it as I'm talking here and looking, sweat pouring off. It's, it's work, it really is. Much nicer to listen to the birds. But whether we both mean the same thing with the same word, that has to be discussed in meeting, if there is any question. Because words are just words, are very arbitrary. And a word itself never is the truth. Truth is not a word. what is actually taking place, if it is not seen through any prejudice or verbal structure, but directly, that's true. And then to put it into words is, is just an expression of something that cannot be completely expressed, because words are limited, thoughts are limited. So, 
if one comes here, maybe for the first time or <clears throat> second time, whatever, can one hold in abeyance one's prejudice against people who all talk the same way, they all seem to talk like Tony, and find out, talk with each other. Because not during retreat, one has to wait till after. And say, what do you mean by that? When you say that, so to probe whether we can understand each other on a level other than verbal. But as long as we talk, we must at least use the same words with the same meaning, pointing to the same thing. And maybe one has never used words other than verbally, and therefore disagrees with a verbal system because one has one's own verbal system. And we can argue all day and all night whose words are better, whose verbal system is superior, but we won't get any place because it's, it's not anchored down in something that is directly observable if one will observe without prejudice, without holding on to any kind of system. I always feel ready, I may not, but I always feel ready, I may not strike you that way, but I always feel ready to, to look again and use a different word or let go of something that causes any kind of confusion. But if something is seen to be so non-verbally, non that is not subject to argument, it is so. And if you say, well, how, how can I tell whether this is so? Do I have to believe you? I say, no, don't believe me, find out for yourself. And then the, the verbal argument ceases and it has to be looking. And can one see the same thing together at the same moment? then there's neither agreement nor this disagreement, then there's just what is. And it's not my point of view or your point of view, it's not a point of view, it's what is. Here and there the question comes up, what really do you mean by self-image? Look in the mirror, we get an image, a mirror image. We have looked into the mirror many times. Have we ever looked without like or dislike at what the mirror reflects? Because if there is like or dislike, we don't see precisely what the mirror reflects. I think the nose is too long or the hair is too, too short or neck too wrinkly. Eyes not big enough. Or there's an ideal image we have of how we should look. And that ideal image of how we would like to look prevents seeing how we actually look. Or we may love what we see. This is the often quoted content of the legend of Narcissus in love with a picture he saw in that river when he bent over or pool in the river he couldn't have seen it, it would have been too wavy. 
to bubbly. But a, a quiet pool and the reflection of his image and loving that image and drowning, trying to kiss it. So we have certain images of ourselves, how we look, which may be all the way from almost accurate to very inaccurate. Even, even as we're sitting here, we can have an image of ourselves, can't we? Sitting here, knees out, and one remembers the color of one's dress, where the hands are, one, the brain can image that. And it can be reasonably accurate or quite inaccurate if one hates the looks of oneself or the feel of oneself today. And then some thought, feeling, sensation, emotion impedes having a, an accurate body image of oneself. In addition to the images of how we look, or how we would like to look. We have ideas about what skills we have, or don't have. What comes to mind right now was personally growing up, being told, or for, for whatever reason having developed the image that is and I have no technical ability, mechanical ability, and therefore not even looking at something that doesn't function, but calling somebody to help. I have no ability, I, don't, I can't do that. Only fairly recently occupied with this whole thing of image and realizing how strong this image is. I have no mechanical ability putting it aside at a time when nobody came, who I called, there was nobody, with a typewriter, and looking and finding out I can see something. Wonder of wonder. <laughs> These people who repair things, they must be looking. And if one looks and doesn't have this immediate idea, I can't see anything, then one, in turning things back and forth and so forth, can discover something and maybe see something that doesn't work right with a ribbon or whatever. As simple things. I have to start <laughs> with very simple things. But discovering at the same time how one also clings to this image. One, has, one is that and one clings to all images, like having collections of things. Stamp collections, some of them may not be as valuable as others, but we like them all because it's our collection. So, attachment to the idea of ourselves and living up to it, being prevented by the image to, to do things because the image says, no, you can't. And but then one begins to look around and see how children are raised in a family where there's a boy and a girl, the boy being punished for hitting the girl, being told, boys don't hit girls. And when the little girl lashes out at, his brother, at her brother, she's told, you've got a good right arm to defend yourself. Now that's not the usual way of maybe giving an image to a girl. But in this case, something comes from that. The girl is having a certain idea about herself, so is the boy, of what he should be doing and what is hurtful, being punished, losing the love of his mother. Once in, in walking around the reservoir there in Rochester, I could hear the little boy just screaming top of his lungs, a very desperate cry. And coming around the corner there, there was a, a huge dog had walked up to the, to the road and father, as I came around, was just picking him up so the dog wasn't 
touching him anymore, but the boy just screamed. And the father kept talking a blue streak at him that boys don't cry. And that this is nothing to be afraid of. It's just a nice doggy. At least he picked him up. <laughs> but what a confusion of reality. A little boy, the dog was bigger than the boy. A very natural reaction to be afraid of. And what is the repertoire of a little child? Screaming or laughing? With some little shades in between. But so much happened at that moment. Confusing the feelings, what one should feel, not what one was feeling, that was wrong. And then what one has to feel as a boy. So this, this is image developing about what we are, what we represent to others, what we should represent to others. Everyone can look. There's examples galore in our life if one begins to look and not just reject the idea that one has a self-image. It's so blatantly there. Maybe not directly discoverable, but in our reactions. The reaction of hurt if we're criticized for something. Told that what, we, what we've done was not right or good, could be better, and immediately hurt. Why? What is hurt? Is, is there an image that one does things right, or the image one should do things right? Because if one doesn't do things right, there is some kind of a punishment l lurking. That's all old memory, not very, very implicit, not very clear, but it can become much clearer as one gives attention to this. So in in getting hurt, this is our, the prime moment in our day to look at what it is that's, get, that's getting hurt. Or what it is that one defends, because one may immediately say, well, uh, it's your fault, or something like that, or you're off the wall. De defending what? We take it so much for granted that we, we don't even question it unless we begin to question it. What gets hurt? What are we defending? What are we protecting? Because in criticizing something we've done, we're not being slapped or beaten. It's not, we're not physically threatened. So what is threatened? What feels threatened or hurt? My image of myself? The words may sound so, one has heard them so many times, but if, if it is seen, then there is a realization that it doesn't need to hurt. One can listen to somebody say something. And if image doesn't come into play, there's no defense of my image or protection of it. There's no, no image to get hurt. I'm not identified with my action. It's just something I do. Then one can hear, is the person reasonable? Does the person have something to say that I could look at? Or is the person off the wall? irritated and needing to have an outlet for one's own irritation by uh, criticizing or attacking someone else, because this is what we do.
eyes one begins to observe this whole drama of self-image one may find that practically with everything one does one wants to be something or become something because thought reflects back like instant playback on what we've just done as some mechanism in the brain that constantly is sort of feeding back on itself, trying to find out what, what am I doing, what am I about, how am I doing. And answering well or not well, poorly or worthy, or in accordance with images we have of what's right and wrong, which were imprinted since day one of our life. So can one become aware of this tremendously habitual urge to be something or to become something? And the habit continues because if we feel we're something important or we can become something significant, then the chemicals start operating inside. Glands are, are, are stimulated to, to trigger energy good feelings. Or if we feel we're afraid we're making a fool of ourselves or people are laughing at us, not taking us seriously, then a tremendous hurt. And also a physical accompaniment to that hurt. We talk about it so frequently because it seems to be at the root of most of our problems as individuals, as two people relating or as groups relating or countries relating with each other. Races one has a strong, maybe unconscious image of another race, what they are like from what has been embedded, what one has heard, maybe not even verbally, but from gestures and expressions of the parents in the presence of someone of a different race. Or innuendos, cartoons. So that prejudice is there. Can one uncover it and not have the image of, I am not prejudiced. I have long ago, since World War II, I left all my prejudices behind. That, that requires real sensitivity and interest and subtlety of awareness. The, the difficult thing about it is, is once there is embedded in the mind a prejudice about someone of another race, black or white or Jewish or Muslim, Once that prejudice is there and it is operating sub rosa, underground, mind is not conscious of it, it's operating unconsciously, then something, somebody of that race does, reinforces that prejudice. We, we try to feed, the mind tries to justify and feed its prejudices, Ver validating them by selective attention, selective perception. Can that be uncovered? Just as one discovers what grass is when one doesn't call it grass, can one look at people of a different race without the idea there? the picture in the mind, what one has seen on television that these people do, 
has done for hundreds of years. Or, and beware of this validating mechanism to validate our prejudice, because we're attached to everything. It's all me. My prejudice is also me. We're ident identified with everything we think, which is evidenced when it is being questioned or attacked, that one feels personally threatened, or made unsure, or shaky, scared. But it's a, it's a false fear because the, it's the freeing from all of this which brings aliveness, not the validating of, of all of our opinions and prejudices. It brings more and more enclosure, thicker and thicker walls in which one feels safe. We think we do. And then we suffer from it at the same time. Someone said, you never said yesterday whether if I have no image, I would become a doormat. You never answered that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Find out. incredible release to be released from the power of an image one has been holding on to. Like stepping out of a coat of armor, the kind that you see in museums looking at medieval garments there of the warriors. It's a stepping out of that, stepping out of the shell. Not having to defend who one is, but finding out who one is from moment to moment. Not through one's cherished associations and affiliations and identifications with this and that. And, but vulnerably open this moment. We will end here for today.